I already won. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce the third lecture concerning uh, integral design and research, a lecture series by Mark Decay. As ma many of you know, Mark Decay is a full professor of architecture at the University uh, of Tennessee, specializing in sustainable design theory, research and design tools. His current work is concerning various applications of uh, integral theory in the experience of sustainable design and uh, to experience nature via building. From the beginning of March 2021, Mark is visiting professor at the U of University of Venice. Uh, within the research infrastructure IRIDE that uh, works for an integral design environment. In IRIDE, the Pride Laboratory, which is organizing and editing this lecture series, is developing studies on the modification and innovation of design paradigms in an analytical dimension of complexity and within an integrated vision of a project culture. The lectures are introducing a framework for uh, thinking about uh, design and design research at any scale. Uh, it is an approach built on the integral theory and developed for architecture in the book Integral Sustainable Design Transformative Perspective written by Mark Decay. The collaborative teams uh, represented in the integral design and research lecture series use this approach because uh, uh, it is useful in tackling and making sense of the difficult and complex problem facing uh, the design and planning disciplines today. In a few minutes, we will attend a lecture by Mark Decay and Susan Bennett. Susan Bennett was educated as an archaeological anthropologist at Columbia University in New York. She is an environmental activist with 20 years of experience and a conservation commissioner in town government. She currently works as a, an educator, meditation teacher, presentation coach and workshop leader, which she had done uh, for 40 years. Susan is the, is the editor of Mark's two latest book, including uh, Integral Sustainable Design, Transformative Perspective. As a trained leader in the Climate Reality Corps, she lectures internationally on solving the climate crisis by design. It's very important understanding the climate crisis across different fundamental perspectives and the multiple contemporary world views. How can we work for solving the climate crisis by design? Which which are the, the, the design's multiple roles in the possible solutions. So, what is missing in the environmental and sustainable design conversation? The title of this uh, third lecture is uh, Integral Perspective, Design and Climate Change. Thank you, Mark and Susan. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you, Margarita. And thank you everyone for having us, for welcoming us here today to speak with you about this. Uh, we so enjoyed spending time with you and getting to know you in the seminar. And we're hoping that you can get to know another aspect of us today as we present this. We're not giving you the talk that we normally give about climate change. We decided to unpack how we've used integral theory 
in delivering various keynotes about climate change and architecture uh, to different types of audiences around the world. So as Suzanne said, our intention is to empower your thinking by giving you some tools and not speaking so much here about the urgency and the reality of climate change, but about what architects can do about it and about how using the framework helps you to understand this larger and more complex problem, which we hope you'll be able to apply in your own work in other ways. We know that you in the design fields have a once in a lifetime opportunity to make a difference for the future of our planet and its inhabitants. We're speaking to you today from Knoxville, Tennessee. So I hope you can see our image there. Uh, the, we're in the Southern Appalachian region in a river valley of the Tennessee River, which you see in the slide. And we're just very close to this uh, city center bridge at the moment. So a little about us, after years of us both studying separately, we lived in different states uh, and listening to Ken Wilbur unpack his own version of, his, of the integral theory. Mark and I met for a week long workshop with him. Since we'd both been deeply engaged with ecology and sustainability, Ken gave us both scholarships. So our meeting was truly one of the meeting, meetings of the minds. On the left is Mark's sketchbook from that workshop in 2004, where we as a team generated an integrally informed way of communicating about the watershed plan that's shown there on the right. And oops. oops. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So the meeting of the hearts came later, and we eventually married in 2009. We continued to work together. As I said, I, I uh, edited two of Mark's books. And at some point, the yearning to do something more about climate change emerged. And shortly after we had this conversation, we formed a joint intention about this, that we were going to work together and we were going to do something about climate change. Al Gore invited us, I had worked with him years earlier, to become trained as climate reality leaders. So we jumped at the chance. We immediately left for Chicago, which is where the training was. And we took it from there. <laughs> it, it, it took us actually some time to figure out how to schedule these presentations. And we were thinking about who our audience would be. And in the meantime, we got invited uh, to go to the American University in Beirut for a week long workshop on sustainable design and also to give a keynote talk. And that was our first, our first keynote. And this was the title of it solving the climate crisis by design. It's a little bold, but we decided to approach the question of climate change by looking at the crisis through the four major lenses of integral theory, and then looking at what architects could do to solve this complex thorny, what we call wicked problem. So this keynote culminated a whole week of workshops with their students in the architecture school. So first we define the problem. Back in 2003, this was the cover of Metropolis magazine. It's a design magazine out of New York. And architects for the first time began to wake up in this country to the fact that buildings use about half of the energy. They run almost entirely on fossil fuels and that therefore buildings were actually responsible for about half of greenhouse gases and the resulting change in the climate. Yeah, in fact, building energy use in the United States is about equal to industry and transportation sectors combined. So buildings really were the big and are continue to be the big elephant in the room. And it's beginning to attract a lot more attention. So you're already familiar with the basic quadrants of the integral theory. So we're not going to belabor that today. Though we use the model to expand what we had learned in our training with Gord, we didn't tell anyone that that's what they were doing. We just used it as a structure to create the talk. In terms of applying these four lenses to climate change, we looked at 
what we call four different kinds of sustainability. In the upper right behaviors perspective, we call that technological sustainability. From the lower right systems perspective, ecological sustainability, more complex. On the lower left, cultural sustainability, the way we look at things through the world views of a culture. And fourthly, in the upper left, a consciousness of sustainability. So this approach now underpins every talk that we give, and we use it because it allows us to access ways of thinking about complex problems and solutions, and it makes those easier to address. It ensures that, as we say, we cover all the bases. Yes, suffice it to say for now that the model organizes very complex variables into more easily grasped perspectives that represent the arts, the humanities, and the sciences. As we go through um, the next series, we'll be using this little diagram on the left in red, and you can see that it represents these four perspectives, which we abbreviate with the pronouns for I, first person perspective, uh, it, upper right, third person perspective, we, lower left, uh, second person perspective, and it's the complex third person perspective. So follow along with that and you'll be able to follow. This is the kind of underlying logic that we use when we're giving a talk. We don't usually say, okay, now we're, you're gonna use some aspect of integral theory. We just say, okay, there are four perspectives. Here's one, two, three. Right. And so we start with the problem. This is how most people think of the climate crisis in terms of resources and pollution, which is true, but it's only partially true, as we shall see. We do indeed live on a finite planet and our resources are also finite. So we do have to manage what we have intelligently. And of course, the other half of the uh, the other half of the problem is that it's a pollution problem. So we say pollution is simply waste that exceeds the capacity of nature to absorb it. We used to think, let's say back when I was in school, that we would run out of resources. Now it's very apparent that long before we run out of fossil fuels, we have a problem with overburdening our environmental sinks. The atmosphere simply cannot absorb all of the greenhouse gases that we are putting into it. The energy trapped by man-made global warming pollution is now equivalent to exploding 400,000 Hiroshima bombs per day. That's a lot of energy we're putting into the atmosphere. It's a big planet and that's a lot of energy, especially if we multiply it by 400,000 times every day. That works out to more than four atomic bombs per second. That's a lot of heat, four atomic <laughs> bombs per second going into the atmosphere. So this is the kind of problem that we presented. And this is what man-made global warming pollution looks like on the ground in everyday terms where we live. This is a coal burning power plant. So what we normally think of here as electric lights are really in most cases, coal burning lights. And when we did the training with Al Gore, we were trained to begin with the problem, you know, it makes sense. So in Beirut, we showed lots and lots of bad news, which we are not gonna go through here. <laughs> and we actually learned that too much bad news <laughs> all at once is a little overwhelming. Right. So we like to mix it up and go from the bad news to the good news right. or from the problem to the solution. Right. So part of addressing this perspective of technological sustainability, we begin to give some solutions from that perspective, some strategies, if you will. For instance, from this perspective, the realm on the upper right of the technological sustainability, the sun and the wind provide more than enough energy to meet all of our needs. We actually already have all the knowledge and technology needed to solve the climate crisis. So from this perspective, the solution is mostly a technological one. We make our machines and our buildings and our cars more efficient. 
we reduce, reuse, recycle. We supply then all of our needs with renewable energy from the sun and the wind. No fossil fuels, problem solved, right? Yeah. And let's just look at wind, for example. In 2000, there was a projection uh, that wind capacity was going to reach 30 gigawatts by 2010. Well, it was, it's not 2010 we're talking about, but 2019. That goal was dramatically surpassed by 2019 by 22 times. So there's plenty of wind for what we need. We like to give examples of how other countries are going carbon free. And you may know that the Vatican was poised to be carbon free. They wanted to be the first country, um, but the Costa Ricans beat them out in 2015 to become the first 100% renewable energy country. Right. And we do some talking about how entire cities have converted to 100% renewable energy. There are five cities in the US and Brazil alone has 15 fossil fuel free cities. And then we follow this energy supply news with how architects can make a difference in this technological realm. When we talk about climate change, we give examples of architects who focus on making efficient use of resources and reducing the greenhouse gas impacts of buildings. Uh, I like to do that with a range from traditional to modern to very contemporary projects. Uh, for example, we might go back to the a more traditional language and look at Hassan Fati, an example of an architect who really applied some modern scientific thinking to a traditional language of form to provide what we think of as high thought, low tech solutions for Egypt's poor. In this public market building, he combined several architectural solutions, the wind catcher, the evaporative cooling tower, ground contact, earth cooling, and updraft stack or chimney ventilation, not mechanical solutions. And also, of course, we can talk about technological sustainability as supplying rational thought to classic problems that we have over and over again, such as how do we make fixed shading elements that can be proportioned relative to the three-dimensional path of the sun, such as here in Corbu's famous mill owners building in Ahmedabad. So luckily there's a strong marriage between mother nature and technology. Um, so let me break this little graph down here. On the right, you can see in these little red bars, the per square foot energy use of residential and commercial buildings in the United States at current consumption rates. And remember the US has some of the most energy hungry buildings in the world. The bars for each of these cities um, show the solar energy per square foot that is available coming to the building on the roofs in orange and the south facades in yellow, assuming that these buildings have some good solar access. So as we can see over here on the left, even in the very cloudy Pacific Northwest climate of Seattle, Washington, the sun supplies more than four times the energy needed and that's just on the roof and even for commercial buildings. So Ed Masria of Architecture 2030 proposes that the solution is a two-step process. And by the way, he just won the AIA gold medal for his work. Step one is reducing the demand side energy loads of buildings and cities. And you, we do this by intelligent design and planning. That is embodying more knowledge in our designs. Step two then is to meet the remaining small loads with renewable energy technology. So design, as you can see, represents a great opportunity to solve the climate crisis. All right, so that was the technological perspective. Now let's look at the ecological perspective on sustainability. If the technological approach helps us to make buildings that are more efficient, but it doesn't actually tell us anything about the patterns and the relationships that characterize ecological and social health. 
For that, we need a different lens, the lens of ecological sustainability. For example, land-based animal and plant species are now moving towards the pole at a rate of 15 feet per day. For habitat migration, the moving of territory, that's very fast. Let's take a look at what that pattern looks like. Right, so this is a simulation based on the current needs of 2,900 species of uh, mammals, amphibians, and birds, which shows the path of their migration as a result of climate change. They're moving to higher elevations and to higher latitudes at rates that are approximately two to three times faster than previously reported. Also, we can begin to see some of the complexities of what's going on in climate change as we begin to look at it from this perspective. For example, a warming atmosphere also creates more extreme weather. Some areas will have more intense floods and others more intense droughts. This is a lake in Lebanon. It's just one symptom of the worst drought in the Middle East in 900 years. So when we have intense heat, that meets lack of water, the crops fail, and people end up migrating to the cities. Yeah, so drought and food scarcity and political unrest are all related, and they're already causing huge losses of life and homeland for millions of people. We know this, it's in the news every day. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has concluded that extreme weather and other climate-related hazards pose a threat to global food stocks and human security. This shows the increase of over 300% in worldwide weather catastrophes over a 35 year period. The frequency of temperatures, droughts, fires, they're all increasing. The frequency of major floods and intense storms is increasing. Right. And as the temperature increases, wildfires around the world are increasing in the dry regions. These are recent fires burning in Africa, as seen from NASA's satellite. Some of these are, of course, human caused from slash and burn practices, but most are actually not. Right, and warmer air holds more water. So as the temperatures go up by one degree, on an average, the air holds 4% more water. This is a photograph of a microburst storm in Dallas. It's like a bomb of dumping massive rainfall with winds greater than 160 kilometers per hour. So if the ecological perspective helps us to understand some of the complexity and interconnections that are present with climate change, it also helps us to understand some of the potential solutions. From this lower right perspective of ecological sustainability, the solution to climate change is seen as incorporating these efficient uses of energy and materials into a network to make the social systems, the building of our built environment, function like an ecosystem. And so the ecologists would say, well, of course, this is a time-tested solution. It's been being developed for about 400 billion years. <laughs> Just a few, few days. <laughs> we're, now we're able to create net zero buildings that produce as much energy on site in a year as they consume. And while net zero is a performance measure, and you think this was the upper right, the process that gets us there is much more holistic, more complex and nonlinear than in the past. There's no way we get to net zero with the kind of, let's say, design thinking, design methods that we saw perhaps 1970s, 1980s. Right. So again, in this more systems oriented approach to solving the climate crisis, the solution is more than a technological solution. We believe that how we get to carbon neutral architecture is by a design process that gets the right things first. This diagram is from Mark's book, Sun, Wind and Light. So it suggests that we can solve the carbon neutral design problem at the lowest levels first. So here we have successive stages um, and design strategies from the level of archetypes 
through technology, passive green systems, all the way up to high performance buildings. And so that's what Suzanne was talking about earlier in the Architecture 2030 proposal. Um, that stage one is really all about more intelligent planning and design. And then the second piece, the actual supply of green energy is the last thing that we want to think about. So the most effective use of those upper levels then has to be based on some solid foundation. So the metaphor being, if you turn the pyramid upside down, it's unstable. Right, and we like to share this example of Charleston as an example of this. It's a very warm, humid summer climate, very hot and sticky. On the left, you see the Charleston single house type. It's only one room deep. It has double porches on the south side and then a garden to the south of that. And the southern gardens ensure that the winter sun reaches the buildings and in the winter and the porches shade the building in the summer. And because Charleston is a peninsula between two rivers, and the winds blow from the southwest across its narrow dimension, the streets and the gardens are aligned to this breeze. So we have the city plan, the site planning, the building type, all coming together to maximize summer ventilation and winter solar access. This attention to multiple scales working together and making up a whole is a defining characteristic of this perspective, ecological sustainability and its solution to the climate crisis. The third perspective from the lower left quadrant, the perspective of cultures, is that they see problem, the problem of climate crisis as a crisis of meaning. It's a crisis that emanates from our stories, our myths, the things that we use to tell ourselves about our place in the universe, our worldview. And each worldview has a dark side and a light side. It has things that work and things that don't. The problem we think perhaps is that we've let the dark side rule for a bit too long. Right. And so here's what the dark side looks like near where we live. This is a coal mine that uses what's called mountaintop removal. The entire living layer of forest is scraped away and the coal excavated hundreds of feet deep. This not only obliterates every life form on the surface, but it has devastating effects on stream pollution and human health downstream. These mining areas have the lowest life expectancy in the entire United States. This is the dark side of modernism and its narrative where life has no value in the economic equation. This is Mies van der Rohe's famous house. It wants us to feel connected to nature, in theory to remove the boundary between inside and outside, but it's also the dark side in disguise, the hidden dark side. This is a glass box architecture in a very cold climate. It is sustained only by huge inputs of energy that can be traced back to those same coal mines in Appalachia where we live. So we'd like to say architects, architects do, do pollute. pollute. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a before and after view of the Canadian tar sands. You may have heard this has been in the news quite a bit. To quench our thirst for oil, the life of great natural landscapes like this are being sacrificed. This is what we mean by a crisis of meaning. This is the kind of story that we have to rewrite. And this is why the largest gathering of First Nations in history recently happened to block the pipelines from the tar sands into the United States and across native lands and rivers. This is climate justice simply because the ones who are most adversely impacted by this environmental degradation are the poorer populations. As the writer Thomas Berry has said, we need a new story of the earth. And now for a look at some of the solutions in this domain of cultural sustainability, 
basically, this is about creating new cultural stories, expressing the values of more developed worldviews. And luckily, it's beginning to happen all over. Yes, meet the Wanganui. You might call it a river, but in the eyes of the law, it has the standings of a person. New Zealand recently granted their third largest river, legal personhood, which will give it rights and interests under the law. And this is another example, one of my favorites from a professor that we know, Ed Nung from Chinese University of Hong Kong. In 2007, an earthquake leveled hundreds of villages in China, and he took his students on a three-day journey up the mountains by foot to reach this village. And when he got there, there was an old woman living under a big tarp. And she said, oh, don't bother with me. I'm just going to die here. And Ed said, no, I'm going to build you a new home. And he promised her one before the Chinese New Year. So he returned his class to Hong Kong and they designed a brand new construction system working with rammed earth, bamboo reinforced, earthquake resistant, utilizing the rubble from the destroyed buildings and local on-site materials. And they tested it in their lab. He has a very amazing lab there. And then they returned and they built a prototype based on local courtyard housing and had passive solar heat and natural ventilation. There's no electricity here. They taught the villagers how to do the construction all in just a few months. And the old woman and her husband did have a new home before New Year's. But then Ed and his students returned to Hong Kong and three months later, when they returned to finish helping the, the residents build the town, they found that the villagers had already rebuilt the entire village themselves and that the government subsidized the project with $700 per family, but the construction was so inexpensive that the villagers made a profit. <laughs> Love that. So we like this little story as a good example of the cultural perspective on sustainability because it so clearly illustrates the way a community of designers can come together and the way a community itself can align behind an idea. Right. Speaking of which, the world is currently undergoing the largest wave of urban growth in human history. To accommodate this tremendous growth, we expect to add the equivalent of an entire New York City every month for 40 years. Think about that. That's a huge opportunity for the building community. In the United States, there's an organization called Architecture 2030. It started back in around 2006. It's led by this fellow, Edward Masria, that Suzanne told you about earlier. Um, and they've posed a challenge, and it's sweeping the profession here, um, the American Institute of Architects, and also the building engineers. And so today, actually this slide's slightly out of date, today our target, since we're in 2021, is an 80% reduction of fossil fuel use relative to a benchmark performance, which we set based on buildings in the US in 2005. So every five years then, the fossil fuel reduction target gets more stringent until we're building carbon neutral buildings for all new construction and major renovations. And they would then use no fossil fuels to operate. And, you know, although this is a set of technical targets, it's also an example of cultural agreement about what to do to solve the climate crisis. It's been endorsed by professional organizations representing over 1.3 million architects in 124 countries worldwide. It represents a momentous opportunity for the design professions. And actually, to skip a graph, I'll just say that uh, in the US, the actual building stock, the amount of building is going up, but the energy use for the building sector for all buildings in general is going down. 
Well, so all of these are different examples of taking the cultural perspective. And one of the ways that we take the cultural perspective is that the building itself begins to tell a story, begins to have something to say about a way of living in the world. This is the house of Lawrence Scarpa, an architect from California. It's known as the Solar Umbrella House. It has photovoltaics across the top and wrapping down the south facade. But it's not really an energy machine, even though it's highly efficient to operate. It's more intended, I think, as a place to experience the climate and the outdoors. And it expresses that idea, a new narrative about being connected, a way of connecting and living with nature. It says that nature and culture, climate and human occupancy are ever present partners. We like to say that what sustainable design means is as important as how it works. Hmm. So, you know, in addition to our crises of resources and pollution, ecosystems and meaning, as if those were not enough, we also have a crisis of consciousness. This is, refers to our interiors. People generally think the climate problem is the technical problem of the ob objective world, but unbelievably, and you probably know this, many people still don't think it's a problem at all. So this image is a protest in Australia. The citizens are suggesting that the government officials metaphorically have their heads in the sand with regard to climate change. 18 of the 19 hottest years ever measured with instruments have been in the last 19 years. And the five hottest years of all have been the last five years. So why is it, we're thinking in the upper left, perspective of experiences where we're looking at consciousness. Why is it that two human minds can be confronted with evidence like this, and one person can see a big problem that needs solving, and another just can't accept the reality? We wondered. <laughs> Many people think that climate change is a hoax created for some economic or political advantage. And we found that when we look at the world, when anyone looks at the world through a certain lens, then we, send, uh, we tend to see the world that way. But what are these lenses that explain such cultural divisions? It's certainly not simply about the facts or the evidence. There's plenty of that. Instead, it's about the difference in the capacity for rational thinking and uncomfortably for many about the difference in the capacity for being able to care. Architecture today mediates the human relationship with nature for better or worse. We spend most of our time in buildings and our primary experience of the natural world is through buildings. So whether it is the American model of suburban housing on the left or the Parisian social housing on the right. Yeah, well, the question is, how do we expect people living in these places to have a strong relationship to nature or to care about the planet or the abstract idea of climate change? Most contemporary architecture does nothing to help us feel connected to nature. Uh, I once worked in an office that was not very different from this one that you see. And like this place, the circulation, the place that you walk around the edge had the best lighting and the views while the people were isolated in their cubicles. That could have been me, that guy who's <laughs> near the window but can't see it. Right? <laughs> and so I quit that job after only one week. And that experience really taught me how buildings can disorient the mind and disconnect you from the rhythms of daily life. Mm. I, I would have to get up in the middle of the work day and go over to the windows, which were also tinted, and just to see, was it raining outside or was it sunny? <laughs> and then there's a whole body of research on this affliction that we, we've written here, nature deficit disorder. It's self-explanatory. 
This brings on many attention deficit disorder symptoms and depression, especially in children, although not enough connection to nature adversely affects all of us. So it occurred to us then that there are two issues at work. One having to do with the vast differences among people in cognitive ability and in morality, and another having to do with the disconnect of people and nature that is expressed in architecture. From this perspective of sustainability consciousness, the solution proposed has to do with human development and with inspiration. Solving the climate crisis requires an emotional resonance of encountering multiple perspectives and views, both in ourselves and externally in others. It also requires one to be able to hold opposing viewpoints simultaneously. And in terms of consciousness, climate change is really complex. Therefore, we began to look at how the levels aspect of integral theory, we're going to now unpack that a little more deeply for you. We began to look at how that aspect, which we call levels, could explain how to speak to different kinds of people at different levels about climate change. One of the people we came across is Robert Keegan, a developmental psychologist from Harvard. And his basic premise was that people's minds develop and they do so in predictable stage-like fashion where earlier stages are always come before the later stages and later stages build on the ones before. In his case, these stages are about what we call a line of cognitive development. And we have different lines, uh, all of us, perhaps a dozen different kinds of lines uh, that we develop along. So in this case, we're looking at the cognitive line. So you can think about it like uh, counting comes before calculus. So he has five stages. Uh, the first order, impulsive mind, single point of view, Second order, role concept. Concepts come into play, say you're born at first order, now a child somewhere, very concrete thinking. Um, along the way, perhaps in high school, socialized mind, now we understand abstractions. Fourth order, this is where ecological thinking begins to come into play. Very complex abstractions, the self-authoring mind where the person becomes a fully articulated individual also. And then fifth order, very high level super uh, complexity, uh, systems thinking comes into play there. And we can simplify this a bit because for me, this first order, second order, and all these names that uh, are used becomes a little hard to uh, for me to remember. So I like to simplify it just a little bit. Uh, <laughs> And, and from five relate, to four. From five to four. <laughs> and relate it to the rational. So we, we all, these are terms I think that are, are more accessible for us. So the pre-rational, not so good with abstractions. Rational, loves logic and abstractions. Late rational, think about that as pluralistic, complex, postmodern thought. And trans-rational, the true complex, dynamic processes and evolutionary systems thinking. Now, why is this important? It's important because to design an ecological system is fifth order, transrational. It's one of the highest levels of cognition that we have. People theorize we can go much further than this, but it's pretty high. And the basic concepts of understanding climate change is fourth order, late rational. Okay, so hold that in our minds because it's not quite that simple. We're gonna add something to this because this is just the cognitive line that we're talking about. Right. So in addition to the cognitive line, we wanted to also look at the moral and ethical development as well. Because as you know, being smart isn't enough by itself. You can have a smart, evil person. <laughs> <laughs> so we ran across these two figures, both incredibly famous and influential in their fields. And their research both discovered a three-stage model 
for two lines, one ethical, the other moral, so very similar. Um, Carol Gilligan studied uh, women and girls and their relationships and what they care about. So we use that one as the primary way to look at it. So she begins with egocentric, everyone's born there, every child, yeah. I care about me. Right. Ethnocentric, we can develop into, most people do, as they grow up, I care about us, my group, my family, my tribe, my people that are like me in some way. And then world centric. I develop the ability to care about all of us around the world, all races, classes, genders, and so forth. Right. right? So just think expanding circles of care and concern. But there's two important po points about this. It's a one way street. We all start at stage one. We're all babies. There's number two, there's nothing to guarantee that an adult makes it to stage three. So of course what Mark did <laughs> was to combine and compare the cognitive and the moral stages. And so what we realized in doing this talk is that different lines of development can be out of phase. And generally, the cognitive line is leading. In other words, we need the hardware and the software in order to develop capacities in other lines, such as ethics and morals. And then we realize that most climate change experts are speaking from a fourth order, late rational cognitive stage and a world centric moral stage. And guess what? in our country at least, about 50 to 60% of people are not world centric. 25 or 30% have not moved out of the pre-rational cognitive stage and the world and climate change look very different to them. So now we're going to introduce a series of levels based on this logic. And if you see that little uh, graphic on the left with the four squares in our four quadrants. We're going to be developing stages or levels in the upper left or the I domain. Um, and just to resonate here, if you get enough people at the same level thinking in the same way, then they take on a collective stage. So we could also talk about stages of worldview in the lower left. But for now, we're going to focus on the cognitive in the eye. Right. And those four little red squares, those are all in the upper left. So what does it mean to expand our awareness? It means that your horizons expand with each new level. Your capacity to take in the world and to be compassionate expands. And your ability to cognitively address complexity expands. So what can be seen and known and cared about expands with development. And you might be wondering if this is relevant to design. I think it is. In the Integral Sustainable Design book, we proposed six major lines of developing the consciousness of an architect. Each has a beginning, intermediate, advanced levels. And such a developmental logic can be the structure of a design education we actually implemented some of this uh, when I was working in our graduate program. And so at this level, the pre-rational, pre-rational cannot see or take in phenomena described from a late rational cognitive stage, i.e. climate change. Yeah, essentially there is no crisis because that horizon cannot be seen, conceived of, or expressed they see a graph or a statistics or a formula, it's meaningless. On the other hand, what does count for value to the pre-rational is firsthand concrete experience. It's real. What, uh, they also pay attention to what respected authorities have to say. Whoever the pre-rational group is thinking is the authority and also then what the tribe, what the group itself believes. Right. So we think that one way to reach the pre-rational, pre-modern, is through a call to what we, we term stewardship. And luckily, each major religion has something to say about taking care of God's creation. Each 
religion also has its mythic, its rational, and its transpersonal path. So in no way do we mean to say that religion is only pre-rational. But there is a large segment of society who believe that God gives people the opportunity, uh, the responsibility to manage creation. Right. And so we took a stab at formulating some healthy expressions of what different stages might say about the climate crisis. And we thought it would be useful to translate some of the kind of language that we've been using to explain it into a language that a pre-rational audience member could hear. So one of the things we came up with is clean air is healthy air. Healthy air means a healthy community. We might also say at this level, we use the sun and wind on our land so we can be self-sufficient and take care of what God gave us. Or, I'm glad to have my both my church and the law guiding me on the right things to do about this carbon thing. All right, so notice that you probably don't have an issue with any of this. Again, this is simply about trying to take the view and honor this level of development. One of the principles is that each level has something to offer. Each level has its dignities. It also has its disasters. But if we look for what's workable, every stage, every level has something to offer. Right. And so now we move to the rational stage. And as we said earlier, people at the rational level, they can see that we have a problem with resources and pollution and the impacts on ecology. Basic charts and graphs do make sense. Okay, this is not a simple chart, but let's see how this works. So you have zero on the right side, that's today. And then we're going back in time, 800,000 years using ice core data. And you can see CO2 is tracking up and down, up and down through the ages. And temperature is tracking right along with it. CO2 goes up, temperature goes up together. 2013, we reach a concentration of 400 parts per million. And along that same trajectory, here's what it looks like after 40 more years. So at the rational level, someone looks at this and goes, hmm, hmm. that could be a problem. Right. right? <laughs> Especially when someone tells you, all right, those major sine waves at the bottom, when we see one of those up and downs, that's an ice age, right? So that much change at the bottom of the curve created an ice age in temperature. What's going to happen with so much increase in right. CO2? So the, the graphs make sense to the rational. The solution from the rational point of view is that we already know what to do. The sun and the wind provide enough energy to meet our needs. The rational, of course, tends to associate itself with the scientific perspective and is pretty suspect of anything on those left-hand interior quadrants. Right. Um, this is a, a, a project by Mario Cusinella uh, in China. You may know this. Uh, it's actually a more sophisticated than just the rational, I think. But at least in this view, the shading, the photovoltaics, the materials really you know, say something about that rational perspective and the way to solve the energy problem. Right, and then the rational level is confident that we already have all the knowledge and technology to solve the climate crisis. And building science, resource efficiency, and climatic design figure heavily in the architect's solutions. We may also see a green approach to industrialization and to prefabrication cut down on materials, be efficient all the way through with time and money and so forth, such as this cellophane house, so-called by Kieran Timberlake. Right. So here are some healthy expressions of what rational stage might say, some sentences that might come out of their mouth. Through efficient technologies, carbon dioxide levels continue to be reduced. It is all paid off for me now. My solar power system has increased my property's value. We are managing our energy sources and environmental sinks to prosper now and in the future. Oops, there it goes. <laughs> so you can see uh, a, a focus on the individual, on capitalism, on efficiency, and so on. Now, now we move to the late rational, 
the late rational, think about it as postmodern, plural also, has a shift towards holism. In the right side quadrants, uh, we move from upper right to lower right, where ecological systems and social systems begin to be able to be seen. Before this, the systems are much more linear. And also on the left-hand quadrants, we move from the upper left to an emphasis on the lower left where issues like climate justice arise. Right, this, uh, this photograph is the 2017 People's Climate March held around the world. And now we clearly see that at this level, how people's circle of care and concern has expanded to include the whole planet. They're feeling the urgency to act. The solutions at Late Rational are totally green. This is where pluralism, contextualism, and environmentalism appear. On the subjective side, the solution is about creating new cultural stories, expressing the values of late, later stage worldviews. We reframe our ideas of nature and how we relate to that idea. So narrative, metaphor, and symbolism become common tools of the architect at this, at this level. It's a postmodern perspective where humans are seen as a strand in the web of life. Then over on the objective side, they, are, they care about things like zero carbon development and ecological cities. Um, these are approaches that require sophisticated and complex thinking. Right. So here are some of the things that a late rational, pluralistic, world-centric person might say. Climate change has made me realize that I'm part of the web of life. It matters what I do. Government, industry, community, and nature are all working together to solve these complex interconnected issues. Working to solve climate change and save the earth has brought our community together. So you see the emphasis on inclusion, multiple stakeholders in a process, um, we are part of nature and so on. And why are we telling you this? Because when we talk to different communities, we are actually sourcing these, these, this speaking at these different levels in order to be heard. We're trying to speak to the way they listen. And from this next level, one can inhabit any of those perspectives when it's appropriate and useful. And from this next level, the transrational or the integral, the problems are seen as bigger than individual buildings. They're bigger than late rational can handle. And seen from this level, the problem has to do with fragmented thought that produces fragmented buildings like this. Uh, as you can see here, this is a, it's a lead gold rated building. So pretty high performance. Um, it's coming from a late rational postmodern green perspective. Yet in a number of ways, which I'm sure you can notice, it has not yet reached a solid integration. Here's a nine, 10 story building sitting all by itself, surrounded by parking. It's making some uh, gestures to the street and to establish scale like a good postmodern architect might want to do or be schooled to do. And yet when it steps back, then it falls back into its modern expression. It becomes essentially a glass facade building. So we have the problem of fragmented thought and less complete solutions leading to a, a fragmentation really of the overall wholeness of our world. Also seen from this level, we have a problem with relativistic values. What does this mean? This means that the late rational easily devolves into a radical pluralism where all values are the same. I'm okay, you're okay. Thus facts become opinions and solving climate change becomes simply an elective belief. Sustainable design as part of the solution becomes an optional value along many other optional and competing values. So these are the problems as seen from this perspective. 
And for the first problem of fragmented thinking, we need to develop several disciplines of ecological design thought. Um, in the ISD book, we outline six of those, and I just mentioned one of those here. Uh, for example, we shift from thinking from hierarchies to thinking in networks. And this is the image here of a green plan that my lab did for a local city here called Chattanooga for their city center plan. And when we started this, we found that there were actually six different agencies, nonprofit, city, state, federal, etc. All of them were managing different parts of the green space in the city, parks, trails, etc., public squares, wetlands, all those things. The river. Nobody had ever put them on the same map, so we did. We mapped them all, and then we began to look for where were the gaps and where were the linkages. How could we knit this into a network that also worked with the urban fabric? So with this network thinking, we began to see patterns at a range of scales, from very local to regional from a tiny square or pedestrian way to the river's floodplain and large parks. So this is just one type of ecological thinking. Now let's look at the solution to the problem of relativistic thinking, relativistic value. The transrational can see that life is developmental. It sees the valuable dignities at each level. Without judgment, one can notice that every stage is needed and that no stage is final. The problem then is due to what each stage cannot see and that climate change is not on everyone's horizon. The solution is to develop more people to later stages. We need more late rational thinkers and transrational thinkers especially working in the design fields. In Keegan's book, In Over Our Heads, he argues that the world we live in is a complex, late rational, or as we were talking about before, fourth order consciousness, pluralistic, postmodern situation. And yet, he says, the majority of Americans who are at second and third order have not developed to the cognitive stage to be able to understand, much less be effective in 21st century society. Thus, he says, we are in over our heads. So how do we develop the designer that can help solve climate change? Well, here are some things that a person taking a transrational lens might say. Things are getting better, things are getting worse. We need the best wisdom of every worldview to solve the climate crisis. The integration of multiple perspectives is what is required. We missed one. There we go. Ah, I like this one. Let us be protectors of creation, protectors of God's plan inscribed in nature, protectors of one another and of the environment. Of course, you've heard this from Pope Francis, that he really does take all perspectives in this one statement. He's speaking to a lot of levels at once. And that's one of the characteristics of the transrational perspective is that it doesn't only speak from its own perspective, but it tries to include a way of communicating to whoever is in the audience. Right. So how do we develop well, with the challenges that climate change presents to us, it's a huge opportunity for personal growth and development, for our own inner work and, and examining our conversations and our actions. To develop the inner architect, we like to say, we need a designer's yoga, a yoga of transformative practices. Developing that inner designer is prerequisite to outer design actions. We can only create based on who we have become. Yoga means, among other things, the practice of being aware of the self. And a transformative practice is something that we do over and over. We do it repeatedly 
and it creates a developmental change. In other words, over time, it helps us to move up from one level to the next. And the more aspects of the self that we simultaneously exercise at the same time, different parts of who you are, then the greater is the transformational potential. Right. For example. Yeah, we do include a number of um, practices in the workshops that we do. Conscious breathing, contemplation, journaling, setting intentions, creative visualization, taking perspectives. We don't do city meditation or walking meditation or physical yoga yet, but uh, yeah. these are some of the transformative practices that the young designers that we've been working with have found very, very useful. And if, of course, there could be others depending on which capacities you're trying to develop. Really, we'd say that right now, today, what we're doing is a practice of taking perspectives. Right. So that's an overview, a sample of how we use the integral framework to open up the question of climate change and also a, just a bit about design's role in the solution. Each of the quadrants and each of the levels can be unfolded further in greater detail to yield a rich perspective, each of which has something to offer. Yes, and you can expand each one of these quite a bit. So we would like to challenge you to both identify the current perspective and the level that you comfortably inhabit in your current work and to stretch yourself to live into more perspectives. We can assure you that the journey will be both challenging and very fulfilling. So thank you for your kind attention. That's it. Thank you, thank you, Mark and Susan. Uh, it is uh, always very interesting to listen uh, your uh, research and your um, interpretation also of the of the world. I think that many uh, questions uh, may be useful uh, for the dialogue with with the present. I would uh, like to ask if uh, there is some question. Please, any question? If you want, uh, uh, please raise your hand and uh, we can uh, discuss. Um, in the meantime, I would like to uh, talk about uh, a question. Um, when you look at the built environment and uh, to the built legacy and, uh, and heritage, the problem uh, with the care and the uh, transformation is uh, very huge in a, uh, in a condition uh, to respect the, the necessity of the of the planet and uh, in addition of um, that is not uh, um, self-referential. So I would like to uh, understand with you, um, how do you consider the possibility to apply this, uh, this vision, this multiple uh, um, perspectives to the built environment uh, that is the, the built legacy and heritage uh, where uh, um, a kind of aesthetic also uh, meaning that is not only the, um, the, the, the meaning for itself but uh, also the aesthetic meaning, meaning and the style that is part of the of the legacy. Um, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I'm not sure that we we have um, something specific to to offer the abstraction of that question. Um, the 
I think the integral approach just asks us to consider that in changing something which exists in that built legacy, we consider its, its meaning to the community, we consider its aesthetic, but we also then have to uh, make some distinctions. So one of the things that the pluralism, let's say the late rational, um, tends to want to do is to collapse distinctions, to make everything relatively flat, to give uh, every person complete equal value, no matter their contribution, right, which is true at one level, but also ignores depth. In the same way, um, I don't know how it is for you, but here in our country, um, a preservationist begins to be interested in everything old, no matter its value. And so we lose the ability to make distinctions about the things that might be uh, preserved in their entirety, uh, the things that might be adapted and modernized, upgraded, um, re-inhabited, and then the things which really have not retained their value. No one perhaps in the past might have valued them very much and they can then be replaced. So we have to use all of our faculties to make those kinds of aesthetic and cultural distinctions. They're not fundamentally technological problems, but we do find ourselves even inhabiting an old building. We want our electric power. We want our internet. We want many things, perhaps even upgraded uh, heating and cooling systems, right? We want to adapt to the present to make them useful for our current situation. Yes, but you know, a lot of the early buildings, the really early buildings did already respect and work with nature, right? They're, they were built before electricity. They did take nature into account. So those qualities of a place, if you're looking to, to keep them or preserve them, are usually already there. You don't need to change that very much, just stabilize it. You know, it reminds me of a place we stayed in Orvieto when we were in Italy. Uh, as you know, the, when you're walking around the city, it looks very old, it's very beautiful. They have maintained it very well. But when you go inside where we stayed, a lot of the in, inner part of the building had fallen down and they replaced it and they kept whole portions of the original building. It was very, very nice. And, and yet, you know, we had windows that opened, we could hang our clothes out if we wanted, and there was a new shower. So there were things inside that uh, made the place really beautiful, but honored the past, honored the original building, actually. So I think that's possible. And they were, they were considering, you know, what was valuable to keep. Uh, Margarita, how do you think of this this question evolving over time and I, dealing with aesthetic? Yes, I I think that uh, the um, the risk in the in many theory is to create a style, a form and formalism and a style. I I think that in the integral uh, theory this is not so possible <laughs> because. Uh, we can uh, understand multiple uh, perspective and it, it is difficult to have a style in a multiple perspective. But when I look at uh, the, uh, the fragmentation and the composition of different aspects, um, I think that uh, this may be also something to understand better in a, in a design theory and in the in the, in the design research. So um, our legacy, our heritage, is a, a very stratified legacy, and uh, 
uh, in the reality of our uh, um, historical center and in uh, our uh, um, historic uh, 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 historic landscape, we have this uh, uh, integration always because we have no water. <laughs> we have we have the um, uh, the necessity of transformation and the relation with the place. Mm -hmm. This uh, relation with the place is also the, is also a relation and a connection with nature. Mm -hmm. It is not only the green, because mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, there is a con confusion about uh, what is uh, uh, nature. In, uh, yes, nature is very uh, large. <laughs> so, uh, uh, absolutely. It, when, uh, when we talk um, in the last lecture, we'll talk some more specifically about uh, different ways of looking at nature. Yeah. And particularly, um, we like to, so we, we talk about it as the um, abiotic sun, light, the climate is nature the biotic things, the uh, plants and animals, and also the ecologic. Right? Yeah. So you have this full rivers, full yeah. spectrum. Yeah. Right? Yeah. In a simple mode. Uh, I like that you mentioned um, transformation uh, because we can also look at um, the question of type uh, and look to the, the history of the type in the place and then uh, how the workability of that type can then become transformed into the present. Yeah. Uh, your question about style is an interesting one. Um, in one uh, in one sense, we have not really talked about the notion of types in integral theory. Um, from one perspective, we can say that a style has to do with a type. Uh, tech, not just typology as we think about it in architecture, mm -hmm. but all kinds of types. And the types run through different, um, uh, potentially through all different levels. So we can have, for instance, masculine and feminine types, right? Through all levels of uh, uh, rationality, right? That, that doesn't have to change, it can be present. So uh, architectural style then, uh, you know, is constantly something that we're looking at through each level. We don't know if there is an integral style. I'm imagining that it will be, as it gets laid down, mm. it's, um, it will be as varied as the different styles that we find in different places and times in history mm -hmm. that we have multiple styles in traditional architecture, multiple stylistic expressions in the modern period, multiple, many, many multiples in the postmodern period. And integral is, a, a, let's say, a relatively new way of thinking, a relatively new worldview. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we say uh, it's groove, it, it's, it's carving a groove in our collective awareness, and that groove is very shallow at the moment. Whereas some of our traditional modes of thinking, even uh, modern scientific thinking, is a fairly deep groove. Mm -hmm. It's hard to change, right? It's there. The integral <laughs> it could emerge. Right, that I think it's still in the process of emerging. But I, I, I don't know. I, I think in terms of style, that you know, if you wanted to maintain a style over time, there are many places that have laws that don't allow you to change the style. They say, oh no, if you're going to build, it has to be in this style. It has to look like it fits. And that's an integral perspective as well. So integral isn't, you know, brand new, shiny glass, everything. You know, it's it's taking the perspective that this is what this culture values. And we value it enough that we actually have laws to protect it. You can't just come in and build whatever you want. 
<laughs> so let's break that down. Okay. Right. So what perspective is that? Well, that you have a cultural perspective. Lower left. Lower left. Right. Um, married to your lower right. Yes. Where your your the the system, the social systems, and the cultural needs and wants are very closely aligned, and you're considering the upper left, the the aesthetics of the place. Okay. So good. You know how it performs is left over. Okay, yeah. how it performs is something that you may have to integrate. Good. So that's the that's the quadrants. Right. And I would. So that's in. Uh, I would say though that yeah. when you're, you're taking the legal perspective. Yes. Which is expressing the cultural value mm -hmm. of, let's say, preservation of a style. Right. That only arises or tends to only arise, at least in our culture, at this level that we call late rational. Right. Pluralistic exactly. green. Right. right. The postmodern now is released from the modern rejection of history in order to look backwards and say there's value there. Yes. Right. It doesn't mean that a transrational perspective is now bound by that. Right. Yeah. So I think Margarita is describing a, a more sophisticated uh, <laughs> idea of fitting one thing. To oh, the yes. Next. OK. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I, I am uh, forever think, about this one. <laughs> I, am, I am thinking that uh, every every um, every time we have to change something, we have to uh, lose something and uh, mm -hmm. acquire something, something else. So um, uh, I think that uh, the, it's a particular um, problem and uh, issue to understand what uh, we are able to lose, mm. and uh, and what uh, we are um, we are um, aiming at. Yes. Uh, yeah. This is um, possible uh, also uh, looking at the. The place, the place uh, in uh, as a, as something that uh, collect the different dimension, the different dimensions of uh, of self, race, uh, history, culture, and uh, ecology, and uh, I think that the place is uh, is something that. Uh, we can understand better as architect. Mm. Uh, but then we have also to open our uh, research to the uh, transdisciplinary uh, issues. And uh, this is uh, uh, interesting also for our experience in the past uh, that is uh, in uh, um, in the connection with other disciplines as arch archaeologists, uh, as, uh, uh, as policies, uh, as, uh, as other um, aspects, anthropologists also. In, uh, uh, and we have uh, to, to understand what is uh, in our hands. When you show the uh, possibilities of uh, the architects in the world to change the situation and to work for solving uh, the the problem, I think that uh, uh, we have to understand better our civic role that is now a different role in the planet for uh, as education uh, as as uh, educators mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as teachers. Uh, so uh, it is very uh, interesting to understand that uh, we can change our building uh, in a, um, in an energy machine, but also in something that is for uh, the the people, for the caring, for caring people, in, in, uh, together with the the, uh, the the place and the and the planet, no. Uh, the the new uh, program uh, European uh, Bauhaus 
is something very interesting in this uh, in this aspect. And an integral uh, approach is uh, is part of uh, of this proposal. I think mm -hmm. uh, we have to understand how we can uh, cooperate for this uh, uh, for this program. I would like now to uh, hear someone of the students, of the students, of uh, research fellows, please <laughs> make your camera on. Well, while you're thinking, um, I, I'd be interested in some of your research fellows who are working with this idea of history and the historic towns and so forth um, and thinking how do we move this kind of context because I, I think in your context it's much more present than than for us how do we move that kind of context forward into um, helping to solve the climate crisis while also addressing these issues mm -hmm. of, of culture and history Mm -hmm. Some of your uh, researchers are working on this. But you yeah. might have another question. Please. Oh, Massimo. Massimo. Massimo, Daniela. Great. Who wants to go first? Hmm. Sorry, it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> it's my fault because I was speaking uh, without the microphone. Um, thank you for uh, for this lecture. First of all, for me, is uh, was very important uh, to uh, see another uh, example of uh, translate the integral approach to a, a thematic to a, a one research. Uh, the part that I uh, appreciate uh, uh, more. Uh, for uh, also co stimulate me, me more is uh, the part, uh, the last part, uh, the upper left, uh, in which uh, we saw all the different uh, levels of uh, approaches. Uh, this is uh, important for us uh, also because uh, uh, help us to understand how to we can uh, expose uh, our research, our works to different uh, public somehow in order to reach and to make it more communicable. So this is uh, interesting. I, I lost some part uh, also because for my screen, uh, like uh, director of the conference, uh, I can see just in the small vision. So, so but uh, but was uh, was interesting this part. And, uh, and uh, in this part, I have a question because uh, um, the first three steps, uh, the first three quadrants have a really strong uh, um, problem and uh, a solution inside the the, the quadrant, uh, a technological one, eco ecosystemical one, and uh, the cultural one. Uh, the last one was uh, for me like uh, uh, the problem of the problem or the problem of the four problems somehow, if I understand uh, exactly. Correctly. Yes. So the, the difference level open after open at the different levels of the different uh, quadrants somehow. So uh, this is like a, a little chain uh, or wheel. I don't know. This is something that uh, return and uh, yeah. open <laughs> that. So uh, this was <laughs> quite uh, uh, difficult, for, uh, but uh, interesting. And uh, another um, thing that I was uh, thinking about is uh, uh, if uh, the um, in the approach, the integral approach, uh, uh, point uh, to a, a concrete problem. Uh, maybe when we are doing a research uh, or something, we uh, look at this problem with an integral approach, but uh, there are other problems uh, in general about the research, the work, a project, and uh, maybe we uh, can, uh, we have not the time, we can't operate on it with an integral approach. 
So is it, uh, this is a paradox or, uh, or maybe is uh, if I work with an integral approach in a specific question, I am in the late, uh, I don't remember the name, uh, Mark, sorry, the late, uh, <laughs> Uh, late rational, late rational. Late rational. <laughs> so I can also uh, see all the other questions that I, I'm not making. You can't possibly answer all the questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you that. just can't do it. However, you can be informed about it and you will have to be because when you start to work on your on your project, all those other aspects will naturally be there. And unless you can make the distinction about where they live in the integral map, you're going to get led into this other realm. Do you see what I'm saying? So in order to, you can take one thing and focus on it, but a lot of what happens in academia is people start fighting with each other about, oh, no, it's this, it's that, no, it's that. And they're talking in different realms. They're talking in different quadrants. One thing has nothing to do with the other or very little to do with the other, right? So, but you can be informed, integrally informed so that you know, oh, that's the performance. Oh, that's the ecological. Oh, that's this, but I'm concentrating on this. Right, uh, but you know about the others and you know where they live. That's being integrally informed. You can't be Superman. <laughs> I mean, you're good, but you know, yeah. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> but to, to your first question or, or observation, um, so we, we took a look at four different levels in the upper left. We could also look at four levels in any other quadrant about climate change. So we could have four different levels of understanding the upper right technology, for example. At the traditional pre-rational level, um, the technological solutions are embedded in the building culture. They're, they're not- the vernacular. They're not fully conscious. They've been developed over a thousand years. There are good solutions to what works for problems that don't change very rapidly. Right? There is knowledge there. Now, from the, another perspective, we can see it. In all the other quadrants, we could do the same thing. We could unpack it. We just wanted to give you a window because it takes too long. You, it would be too boring <laughs> to sit for four hours right. and, and, and go through each, each different one. So we call this in the integral model, all quadrant, all level. In each quadrant, you have all the levels. And when the world is healthy, there's a correlation between a level in each quadrant. So a level three late rational thinker in the upper left is also using level three late rational science and seeing the world as a level three late rational system and operating in a world view from the lower left, which is late rational pluralism. They all relate and connect if it's healthy. And that's why we can say there's a problem at each level and there's a solution at each level. Yeah. So in the quadrants, we only gave you a couple of samples of how to see the problem and how to see the solution. You could have 10 or 20 problems, 10 or 20 solutions in each quadrant. Right. Okay, Mark, but uh, uh, just another uh, clarification. Uh, uh, I can be uh, late rational in a quadrant and post uh, and pre rational in another one. They are uh, just uh, status and uh, every is the thinking that is moving somehow, but the, the people could be is not uh, at the third level always, for example. Um, all right, so the developmental psychologist is I understand this. I'm not a psychologist, but um, 
one of the ones that uh, Wilbur bases the integral theory on, um, Claire Graves, um, talks about the levels and he, he divides them into tier one and tier two. And in terms of what we presented today, tier one would end with the late rational. And tier two begins with the trans rational. And what he means by tier one and tier two, and it's very hard to move to the second tier. It's a, they call it a momentous leap. Tier two has the ability to see the levels, to see the spiral of human development. Before that, if we're walking around in our rational universe, we imagine that's the end. Think about how self-centered the Enlightenment thinkers were, right? From our perspective, we look back and they thought, we have reached the height of human development. We have discovered rationality, reason, right? Now we have post-rational thinking that says, ah, oh, well, that was a little bit limited, wasn't it? You still had some big problems like slavery, <laughs> which it took you. <laughs> took you quite a while to get out of, right? Yeah. Eventually, though, we developed and, you know, in 100 years, that institution disappeared. Right? So you, if, you're, if you're in a tier one, our first three levels that we talked about, typically, if things are out of balance, it's an unconscious imbalance. In other words, we're operating with a methodology about how we think about the city, for instance, or how we think about scientific phenomenon. We're operating without knowing what level we're operating at. And that brings us into clashes unless we take the awareness that, ah, that's a level two over there. And it's very useful for this reason, but very limited in other ways. So that's what we're after, and it really becomes useful when you can articulate the methodologies of each quadrant. When, as Margarita was saying, there's this question of the different disciplines, because the disciplines get very good at one quadrant, usually. And in that quadrant, they tend to have a level, one level. And for instance, I know a colleague who is very good with statistical analysis and surveys. And all she does is statistical analysis and surveys, as if that was the only tool in the whole world. Now, she's an expert at that. But try to enter a conversation that says, what can the survey not tell us? Where, where is it lacking? And it's a difficult conversation. But in a team, that person is really valuable. Someone, however, has to recognize that it's valuable but limited, as are the other methods that people might use. Does that answer it for you, Osimo, somewhat? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mark. Uh, okay. Daniel, Daniel, I put you for the question. Yeah, Danielle is in here. Thanks for the yes. question. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mark and Susan. It was really interesting. I have um, a collective question uh, that is coming uh, from me and for, from Marco. Um, can you please uh, clarify um, in the ecological pyramid, pyramid that you show us uh, what is uh, uh, the archetypes? We, did, uh, we didn't get it. Do you understand me? Uh, so, no, I didn't hear that fully. Ask one more. Um, the, um, the ecological pyramid, pyramid you show us, there are uh, the, the first step, the archetype. I don't know if I tell in the, 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 the,
And the pyramid. Yes, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. thank you. Sorry, sorry yeah. for yeah. my yeah. bad English. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No problem. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, the archetypes, that would be at a fundamental level. Like the vernacular. Right? Um, the, the, ah, the, the, so we didn't get what you mean with yeah, yeah. the... Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So for the example, vernacular. Okay. Uh, 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 or, okay. or the things which are tested over time and and tend to be more universal. For example, uh, if we say there is a roof like this and there's a roof like this and there's a roof like this. So we have three options, the butterfly, the flat roof or the gable roof. And then we ask a thousand people, which roof feels more sheltering, this one? or this, or this. A thousand people find this to create greater sense of shelter. They may find the horizontal roof more connected to the landscape. And they may find this to be very, a feeling of openness, right? Those are archetypal. In fact, um, there's a nice book called Archetypes in Architecture by the Norwegian, uh, Thomas Dias Evensen, um, and he has hundreds of these things. Um, so it could also be um, the open frame structure in a warm and humid climate, or a closed shell structure in a hot and arid climate. Right, right? thick walls. Those are archetypal solutions, things that have been found to work for many, many times, many years. Then we can build on top of that, right? But why, from the integral perspective, we want what works well, and we want to keep that. So we consider uh, siting, orientation, uh, basic massing, Shape, basic shape, things like that at that level of archetype. Does that? Yes, yeah. I think it now. Yes, thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. <laughs> yes. then, you know, from the energy perspective, we have to upgrade that. We have to then begin to look at the envelope, the materials, the heat flows at a certain next level of complexity. We have to have a relatively efficient shell before using the natural site energies works very well. So then the third level up, we call passive or green. Now we can use the sun for heating, the sky to light buildings, the breeze and other forces to help cool them, right? But that begins to be a level three technology that comes in the upper right when we arrive at um, late rational because now we can actually have a concept of how the rhythms are flowing and we understand the physics that's happening in a more complex way than at the level of archetypes. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. And then uh, another question that it's uh, not uh, just related to architecture, but it's more general. Uh, you talk about the capacity to be able to care about the planet. And um, I was asking myself, um, do you think uh, there is a, I, I, okay, there is a, a relation between the, the extraction of each person and the capacity of, to be able to care about the planet. And I think there is a, a connection also, if this person get an extraction in a, I don't want to say rich, uh, but uh, there is a difference uh, between people that uh, have a good extraction and, peop and poor people that uh, uh, didn't get an extraction. So um, maybe, do you think uh, that it's uh, important to uh, talk about the, the planet in the school, I mean in basic school, public school, high school. So do you think there is a strong connection 
or do you think it's not important? Because uh, I also have been in my life meeting rich people uh, who didn't care about the planet. So how to deal uh, with this? Sorry, all, always for my right. bad English. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a that is a complex issue, actually, because like you said, there are a lot of rich people who don't care at all. So it's not about whether you're wealthy or even about, this is why we also looked at the moral and ethical development, because it's not just about having a brain or having a high cognition, but that idea of the open heart, of the you know caring for the world or caring for others is on the moral and ethical line of development. And that, you know, that can be, um, inoculated, if you will, by a certain kind of instruction, by a certain kind of speaking about or inspiring about um, why one should care. But ultimately, it's a development of the inner person. It's a development past ego, past me, 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 right? And that happens on a lot of levels. You know, that happens with your parents, that happens in schools, it happens with your friends, it happens in your politics, it happens in your town. It's, you know, it's, you're, we're constantly being enlarged. Uh, our awareness is being enlarged, some of us, right? But some, some people don't care. You know, we just had a president who did not care. Yeah, it was painful. Very painful. Yeah. So you can think of that as arrested development. Right. <laughs> you know, the development again just stops at a right. certain place. Yeah. And also there's there's a, a level of economic um, situation where people are in survival. They they could care less about the planet or other people. They're just ha looking for the next meal. You know, that's that's really present with all these people who are now leaving their homes and trying to find some place to live. You can't expect them to have this expanded care and concern about the planet. It's not reasonable. So that's also an example of another aspect of integral thought, which is states. Mm. So what you're describing, Suzanne, is um, that any of us can drop to a low state, to a state of survival. So if you know the famous psychologist, Abraham Maslow, he has uh, what he calls the hierarchy of needs. And if we're in survival, if we're worried about our safety, our food, our shelter, et cetera, we cannot actually um, pay attention to higher needs. So caring about everyone on the planet is less important for most people when they're starving, right? Or when there's a war and they have to run away from home quickly. <laughs> right. So that's a state also, not just a stage. And in threat, we tend to drop down to lower levels, right? When yeah. we feel threatened. Yeah. But there's another aspect to your question about um, education and yes. also the difference between the cognitive and the moral. So in the pre-modern traditional world, uh, before the enlightenment, we had, um, we had art and science and morals uh, undifferentiated, right? The church would, would be the definition of the reality of the physical universe, for example. Um, in modernism, in the Enlightenment, we began to differentiate those things, right? We said, ah, in the realm of science, we might have, that they might have something to say about science, but not so much to say about morality. So art, science, morals, what Wilbur calls the big three, those began to be differentiated. Now we find ourselves in a late rational, pluralistic, postmodern society in most Western cultures. That's the dominant. That's what dominates education, particularly in the university, but also in the high school. 
Now we have art, science, and morality completely dissociated. So if you were to go to a public school in our country, you would find nothing about morality. That's left to religion. You would find about science and almost nothing about art. Right, almost nothing. Art is Art would be 1% of the education, right? So they're completely isolated and separated from each other. So what happens is then we've now created a situation, our green pluralistic culture that wants to include all the perspectives has actually separated them so much that one can become very high on the cognitive scale and still be anchored down by a very low uh, aesthetic perception or a very low moral ethical perception. All right. So we need, I guess the answer, right? I mean, my position, <laughs> right, would be to pull those back together so that what Integral is now beginning to try to do is to reintegrate those quadrants, if you will, or to reintegrate what modernism differentiated, postmodernism completely tore apart, right? To pull them back and say, can they not be related again? Yeah. Okay. And it applies also okay. to your interest in the social, <laughs> the same development from egocentric to ethnocentric to world centric also applies to social issues, not just to environmental. They're the same. Stefano. <laughs> Thank you, Daniela. Hi, hi. Thank you. Can I ask you something? Yes, yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I use uh, Massimo's computer because my I have some uh, Teams uh, trouble. <laughs> totally <laughs> fine. <laughs> so, We're on the same one. <laughs> yeah, yes. Thank you for the interesting lesson. Of course, and uh, it was interesting the last part of your uh, presentation, mainly when you show us the some master plans or so on. And I was wondering in the if uh, in the contemporary era now and uh, with more evidence maybe in, in Italy, it's every time more difficult to, to realize than to realize and build great master plans or uh, urban settlements. No, so modify entire parts of a city is um, more and more complicated because of the, the fragmentation of the economy or difficulties in political and territorial decision and so on. So. Uh, how can we operate uh, in, in reality with uh, with high impact solution in your opinion? <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, you, Susan. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. Well, we'll have, have a aperitivo have, about this, right? I have so. three ways. <laughs> three ways, no. <laughs> Suzanne says, uh, don't ask the professor unless you want the three part three answer. Three part answer, right. right. No. Uh, I, I, I agree with you that uh, the master plan as, um, as the modernist instrument is, is dead, right? I think, for us in, at least. Um, however, um, I think now we actually have the opportunity because we've also seen the failure of fragmented uh, planning mm. for 20, 30 years now. We've also seen the failures of um, uh, planning and urban development driven only by policy, by people that write rules without exploring the formal implication of those policies. And essentially, we've also seen the failure of um, bottom-up grassroots planning. So there's also another school of thought that says, we should just include everybody and ask all the citizens what they want, and that will somehow uh, have a bunch of big meetings. We call them charrettes here. Stole it from the French, I guess. Um, and that also seems fraught with failure. Um, so what's, what it, 
seems to me is missing is one. I don't know if there's three things. <laughs> at least two. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you'll find two. It's more. it's now. I think given those failures has the opportunity uh, once again to create vision. Mm. And not the vision necessarily of the master plan, because the master plan was a singular vision, often carried out usually by an old white guy, right? Uh, without so much consulting and input. So we, we can learn something from these processes along the way of stakeholder participating input. But all of the neighbors in the neighborhood uh, are not going to come together and create the vision with the skill and mind of the architect or the urban designer. That still has some value, right? If mm. one can bring some humility to it and offer a vision which then we like to call it alignment. We get alignment behind a general idea. So if we know then the larger whole of which the parts have to contribute, then it doesn't have to be carried out because one of the problems with the master plan, right, was how do you implement that? And can you do it without being um, authoritarian. Mm -hmm. So in the 1960s here, we had master plans like in my city and we tore out huge sections of the urban fabric to put in highways. Uh, we have one place we call it the spaghetti bowl because it's like each ramp and flyover and highway is a piece of spaghetti. It's horrible. And it's just a big snarl like that. Yeah. And it displaced um, all these neighborhoods. So the vision, but also um, perhaps a more piecemeal implementation. So that's where things like um, like rule structures that underlie um, and and are and where we know what the pattern that it creates is. We know the rule and we know the pattern. And and then I think I don't know, this is speculating, right? Um, but then I think it becomes possible when each player, whether it's an owner building a house to complete the pattern of a street, or it's uh, the city who's um, making a new sidewalk or a new street or a new place to plant a tree, they know the pattern. And the pattern has to add up to something, right? And so then we begin to think in terms of scales. So the plan I showed you was just, if if anything, a vision. You still have in that city we have the um, we have the federal government with the national cemetery. We have uh, the state government with parks. We have the city government with parks. We have a quasi governmental agency that manages the river system and the lands along the river. We have nonprofit private organizations, land trusts, land trusts, all of these players. No plan. Right? No, no collective vision. So it takes all of those players and yet they have to know when I make this move, does it add up to something? Does it contribute to building a larger whole? Right. That's all I got today. <laughs> <laughs> and I would just say that to add to that, that, I think Mark did work a lot with a lot of different types of people on that plan. I think the power in it is practicing speaking your vision so that it inspires others. Inspiration is key. You you want to you want to get them enthusiastic and excited about the vision. So a lot of it is practicing your speaking about that vision, um, so that people are like, yeah, yeah, okay. You know. <laughs> 
we're, we have a little bit developed on this idea of um, working in teams, enrolling other people, um, speaking powerfully about the idea in such a way that other people get enrolled. Um, so we can we can share some of that in the seminar. In the seminar, yeah, we will go over that. Yeah. Yeah. Good questions. Oof. Very well. <laughs> Anyway, I hear you, Massimo. I hear your intention behind all that. Stefano. Stefano. <laughs> <laughs> this is the same uh, uh, mistake that uh, I always do. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, okay. The bodies, right? <laughs> Changeable. <laughs> okay. Good like each other. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Mark uh, and Susan. Uh, I don't know if there is some other uh, curiosity, question, issue. If no, from students, any one uh, question? It's too late. Okay. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Thank you so much again. All right. And, uh, we will meet. You're welcome. We will meet it uh, again. Yes. Two and weeks. If anyone has any questions, they can always get them to us through Teams. You know. Okay. Yeah. Then, uh, on next Wednesday. Yeah. So and wonderful to see everybody again. Yeah. Tune great. in in two weeks with uh, Pygmalion Karatsas. We'll talk about architectural photography and the integral model and bring in types. Ah, very good. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Good, good evening, good afternoon, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, see you on the uh, in two weeks. All right. All right. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Thank bye, you. bye, Margarita. Grazie. That was great.